Going live. You're live. All right. Welcome <clears throat> to the Microsoft Card Chat on Zoom, number 203. I'm your host, Greg Galb. The gang is all <laughs> Luff and John and Mike and Don and John and Chuck and Tony and Dennis and Dewan and Jeremy and Bob and Jim and Garth and other people. Let us talk slot cars. I'm going to go ahead and begin with the announcement that we are now taking submissions for the Worldwide Slot Car Chat proxy host track nominations, submissions, however you want to call it. Uh, there is a link in the Zoom chat, and I'll post it to the YouTube chat as well. To download the form, just hit that link. If you, if you want to be a host or you, you have a buddy who wants to be a host or whatever, uh, make sure it's okay with them before you fill out the form. But then fill out the form and email that to me. My email address is at the bottom of the form for your reference. But as always, it's ggalb at ggalb.com. That's G-G-A-U-B at G-G-A-U-B.com. So go ahead and download that form. If you want to be a track host, we're looking for... Uh, worldwide tracks, right? So if you're in the UK and you want to host, absolutely fill out the form. If you're in Australia, fill out the form. If you're in Canada, fill out the form. We, I'm not real worried about US tracks. <laughs> I got half a dozen around me that would be happy to host. Plenty in SoCal, plenty, plenty across the States. We want to try to get some tracks in the UK and Canada and Australia and Europe. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure things out. So submit your host nomination forms. We're going to stop taking nominations, I believe, at the end of April. So basically, the forms need to be into us by May 1st uh, for track hosts. And then we'll figure out what the, what the actual tracks are going to be for the proxy and then open up participation entry after that. Uh, <clears throat> that is the current timeline, such as it is. So yeah, click the link, fill out the form, send it to me. Moving on. Anybody got show and tell they want to share? Raise your virtual hand so I make sure to call on you. Um, did you say you were going to put that link in the chat? It is in both the Zoom chat and the YouTube chat. I don't and see it in the Zoom chat. I sent you, I sent it, I'll, send, I'll post it again in case you don't get old chat messages. There it is. Apparently, latecomers don't get chat messages that have previously been posted. <laughs> there it is, again, and it's on the YouTube. And I'll put it in the YouTube, I'll put it in the YouTube video description. So, if you're not watching this live and you don't see the live link, hit hit the more at below the video, and and the link will be there to to download the form. Okay, show and tell time. Raise your hand. Bob's got his hand and, up. And, and Mr. Sampson, please go to the office and get a tardy slip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to, to be fair, I put I put the link in the chat. Like, you know, as soon as Dewan sent the form to me, I put I put it on my website. Put the link in the chat. It was like five plus minutes before mm -hmm. the hour. So, <clears throat> go ahead, Bob. Don't forget to unmute. Don't forget to unmute. There, there we go. go. Quick question. Um, mm -hmm. The tungsten putty. I had a bag. It was open. It went dry. Is there any solvent you can reactivate that stuff with that has anybody found? I mean, it's just like rock hard. Can't do a thing with it. No, no idea. No. <laughs> oh, I've tried a any. few different oils. I've never got it to come back. Well, you know, okay. you know what you, you know what you could try that melts almost everything is lacquer thinner. Okay. Although that, no, I got to warn you right up front, that stuff is really, really volatile, and it it's just not pleasant stuff to work with, which is probably why it'll work. Okay. Yeah. Where, what, brand, oh, what brand of tungsten putty is it? Uh some of the slotted. You know. I guess so. we could ask Maurizio one of these days what how to regenerate that. I mean, it would seem some kind of oil or grease because it's in a little plastic thing and it's all messy. And I tried it. Yeah. Are you, well, I, I mean, must have opened the is, bag and then didn't seal it back up all the way and went to use it. And it was unusable. 
I mean, is it literally rock hard? Can you form it at all? Because the, the the slotted putty is different than a lot of other putties. No, wouldn't. Not at all. Yeah, not usable, unfortunately. So. That does a hunk. Yeah, I had the same thing happen with the slotted putty. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, not even sure what I did with it, but uh, just thought I'd ask. Thanks, guys. Well, hopefully somebody out there can provide an answer, or maybe we'll get one for next week. Okay. Moving on, Jim, go ahead. I got some new stuff. And I got oh, a lot nice of new stuff. stuff. It's not often you get 24 brand new slot cars. <laughs> and they're uh, probably used a little bit. Well, they're, they're used, but they're really good. So I'm probably just going to keep them. Uh, <laughs> These are the, uh, I'm getting ready to take them to a test track. Th these are the proxy cars from the 2023-24 uh, Le Mans Classic Proxy. Uh, the car in the upper right is Courtney's. These are the, I think these are the top five cars. I'm getting ready to take them to a test track this week to do some further testing and evaluation. So these are the top three finishers. This is the podium essentially after 10 races. And I guess this is kind of show and tell and kind of club corner, but anyway, um, they're really good. These top six or eight cars were really good. There were not too many bad cars, but it's interesting to see that there's totally a huge difference uh, in the cars that finished in the top three. Uh, you know, one looks pretty much like a standard NSR. Courtney's is a thunder slot with a slim cam motor. And then the Starfighter Ace is a, a Ferrari body on a different chassis. And so top three cars, totally different theories. Uh, and like I said, these cars run really good. I'm going to put them through their paces again uh, at the track that we ran the Northern California round on, or one of the Northern California rounds on this coming Thursday and do a little testing. May swap some tires around and see what goes fast and uh, see what goes slow. So that's it for show and tell for me. And Courtney, by the way, finished. He won the last two races of the series and ended up, ended up finishing second. Oh, cool. Courtney's car is cars coming apart on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a full tech inspection. We're just absolutely make sure. Yeah, <laughs> probably should yeah. unwind the motor too. I was just going to mention that we're going to dewind the armature and see how many turns are on it. And we'll... <laughs> <laughs> All right, and people can go to your channel to see what you're doing. That or uh, the my channel has the re the race that we ran in my area. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be a video probably next week because I, I can't get to the track till Thursday. So probably early next week, we'll have a video. And I, I'm going to take one of the cars that ran very poorly, quite frankly, just spun the tires everywhere, throw a set of really good tires on it for that track and just see what happens. So well, we're, we're going to have some fun with them and, and kind of, you know, examine them and see why one car was fast and so forth. So Cool, cool. Looking forward to that. And Garth's got his hand up. What would you like to share today, Garth? I got uh, a new motor pod that I just got yesterday. I want to show it to everybody. Ah. Is that good? Yep. Okay, this is a, a, a version of the torsional twist pod, okay, with some differences. Okay, basically I split, split the thing in two. I added a um pocket up here for a tungsten part and then this has got a uh torsional twisting item and there's a there's a bar here and a tube okay so this is a hole and then that's a tube uh you know a tube that fits into the hole and rotates back and forth a couple I got a whole bunch of photos of it and I ordered three of these, so, and I'm working on a car to test it. Again, a Ferrari F40, my favorite car. That's kind of what it looks like in the chassis. You see, it's it's got this, you know, the tube is locked, locked down just like a regular plot.it pod, and it rotates on that too. It's like from the back. Inside, it's SLS nylon. 
There it is with the uh, motor in it. Like I said, I just got this yesterday, just got these uh, parts yesterday afternoon. So I'm working on this, uh, a test car for it. Two photos. There, there's again, you see the rotating uh, thing there. It's a Ferrari, uh, a slot that it, or a uh, Polycar uh, Ferrari chassis with a, it's got 3D printed wheels, 3D printed guide, and a 3D printed pot in it. What are the two holes on the side of the magnet? The, the, the two the holes on the side are, those are the Jim Rose holes, okay? That, that's designed for a, uh, uh, a, a, a M2 set screw. So when you put a uh, slot dot it tungsten thing in there, oh, you put that. You can screw that. You can screw a, a either a screw or a um, set screw in there to hold it in over the top of the thing, and then it it leaves the uh, it leaves the uh, the tungsten, uh, you know, uh, bar loose in there. Okay, so okay. It, it's it's in the hole, and it's it can in the rattle. Hole, but so it, it it has a little uh, free movement yeah. or a rattle, as they call it. Yeah. Mess dampers. And so it's like <clears throat> use it or don't use it. It was uh, Jim thought it was a good idea, so I just said, okay, I'll put that in there. Cool idea. Um, are you going to put some sort of springing in, or are you going to? Uh, would you mount springs at the back of something like this to control the amount of rotation or to stiffen the rotation? Well, it's a total test right now, so I, I haven't even run the car yet, so I I don't know. You know, it's uh, the same kind of car that the the original I beam style motor pod was put in it. You know, and it ran good when it was just an I beam. Yeah. Okay. This this is just a kind of a twist on a twist, if you, <laughs> for lack of a better explanation. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's um, it's a nice um, or a nice uh, reinterpretation of what some of the other um, companies do, like Scale Auto or Avon Slot or others, where they have a pivot at the front of the pod. Uh, something that you have haven't been able to do with a slotted before. So uh, I think it's really nice. Clever. Let's see how next week I'll tell you how it comes out. I I haven't even had a chance to really run the car yet, so it's just under construction. There it is from the bottom. See, I left it a little bit. I debated on this on whether I should push this up tight or not, but um, for the first version, I said, okay, I'm just going to leave it a little bit short so they don't have to sand and stuff like that so but surprisingly to me i i you know i was worried about the inside and outside diameter of this and so i what i ended up doing was on the cad file i ended up uh, using it uh, both dimensions exactly the same okay and it came out like really tight in the on, on the parts i mean really almost not usable tight. So a little bit of sanding on the tube part of it, and it just it's perfect. It, I mean, I got like a lucky is what it amounted to, because I, you know, I instead of trying to fool myself into like figuring out what, you know, what dimension I should have there, I just said, okay, I'm just going to start out with a mean dimension. And it worked quite good. Okay. That's what it looks like. It's almost it's almost ready to go. I just got done with this. That's what it looks like in the back. Again, it's got Professor Motor um, bushings in it. That's the uh, polycar body on it. It kind of reminds me of the Fly Racing pod system where they have just a knob in the front that sits in a in a kind of a um, padded holder. And then in the back, you've got the two pod screws. And they, did, uh, they did. Yeah, screws. yeah, so, yeah. I, 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 I've seen that before, like kind of like a, a trailer hitch sort of arrangement Is that what you're kind of describing. 
where the where the uh, there's a ball, you know, on this part of the mm -hmm. on uh, that part right there would have like a ball on it, and then this part would go over the top of that and yep. would rotate on the ball. This is just, you know, this is a just a, a spin on the torsional twist. Okay. Yeah, but the 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 pipe and and rod are allowed to freely rotate within one another. There's no there's no torsion in there. It's just a pin. It's just a hinge, right? You're right. Well, it absorbs the torsion. I mean, it allows it to it allows it to you know it twist it, it itself. I mean, it's reasonably tight. Okay, you know what I mean. It's not it's not you know you understand what I'm saying. It's like zero fit. Okay. Okay. So it's in, so it's like a, a it's a slip fit. It's not an interference fit. It's a but it's a slip not an interference fit. It's a it's a it's a it's a slip fit. Okay. And yeah, and I, I guess you don't want anything less than a slip fit because otherwise it might just uh, start chattering. Yeah. That's that's that Dennis is exactly what it, I was thinking, but yeah, so and I thought okay, I, okay, it's got to so, be. Yeah. I you thought if it came out to the even more so than the fly then, because the fly, the ball at the front is is trapped. I think that might, there might be like a, a, a rubber or vinyl component to it, to basically, that allows the thing to turn or twist, but holds it in place. So it's not just mm -hmm. yeah, this, the thing. This can turn or twist, but it's a, it's an encapsulated motor yeah. pod. So it's basically <laughs> uncoupling in a, in a, in a sort of a, scientific way it's uncoupling the uh the chassis from the motor pod sort of the motor area okay and what dennis was saying is exactly how i felt about it. i thought i got it's got to be it's got to be almost a hydraulic cylinder kind of thing okay where it fit you know the the tube fits into the uh into the hole and it and it has it's a long enough depth in there from here to there <clears throat> it gives it a good purchase so it's good so, I think it's going to be real interesting to see how it works. Garth, yeah. Garth, I've, got one, I've got one suggestion. Uh, can you can you go back to the rear, the view from the back? Yeah, that one. What yeah. I think I would do is those on the pod, the where the motor, where the screw holes are, whatever you want to call that, the perch or whatever that you know the, on the pod yeah, itself. Buses. On the bottom of that. What I would do is shave about a half a millimeter off of that and then put a half millimeter silicone washer in it so it's not raising the ride height, but it's absorbing the shock. And if you, if that doesn't work, you could just put a, a half millimeter steel washer in there and, and try that. So you could play with different, different uh, suspension type ideas without raising the ride height and putting something in there. Uh, I got a question for you. And if... Say this was a, a non, say that it was just a, the regular uh, I-beam pod, okay, that had, didn't have a rotating tube in it or anything. Would you still do that? Uh, not necessarily because the I-beam, the, the torsion pod's taking that stiffness out by itself. But right now there's, there's nothing, there's nothing inhibiting the movement at all. And, uh, you that, might I think that was the mistake that I made. I, there, the the torsion bar is inhibiting the motion. Right, it's and not, this one, yeah. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's well, not allowing free rotation. It's not allowing. Yeah. So basically, the torsion bar is doing the same thing as suspension on the back pod legs. Yeah. Yeah. This is. It's and, functionally solid. It's just built as two pieces. Yeah, and then don't forget that it's it's a slot that it kind of style and you also have the ability to tighten or loosen the uh the screws in it okay to have the pod floating forward or backward or however you would like to do it okay so like i said it's you know it's a version two of this type pod so anybody got any other questions or anything so i mean the 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 Interference between the two parts is such that if you if you held the two parts in each hand and turned them, would you be able to, or would it be likely to break at a weak point? 
I'm just trying no, to establish how, how connected they are. Well, it's totally free, right? Let me quantify that a little bit, okay? I'm going to go back in the photos here in the beginning. What's rotate freely without binding? Because if, the, if there's any binding between that tube and that pin in the tube, then it will twist, stay stuck. Okay. Really, that That's pin in that to tube should be released, I think. Okay, let's let Garth explain it one more time. Okay. Uh, on the CAD file, okay, this hole, okay, is X dimension. This, that's an inside diameter, okay? The outside diameter of this tube is X dimension. And you can see there's a, there's a, it's hollowed out as well, okay? So if you had these parts, if I, if I took this part and this part, and I tried to put this part into that part, okay? I could maybe get it in a quarter of an inch, okay? And it would be a complete bind, okay? You know what I mean? It'd be dead ass tight from yeah. the friction of the finish on the, this is a raw finish on the SLS, okay? Yes. But you, so in order to make this rotate in there the way I wanted it to rotate and the with the, the kind of friction or non-friction that I wanted to do, I, I sanded this part, took a put a piece of sandpaper over that and rotated that tube back and forth. Probably took off about, on my measurements, probably about two thousandths of an inch at the absolute outside, okay? And uh, and then I just kept, kept goofing it with and pushing it in, pushing it in until I got it into where that 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 part there is. It's all the way up in here now, but it's like I said, it's dead tight. I mean, it's it's not it's not there isn't any. You know, it's not going to honker back and forth this way or that way because it's it's it, got it needs to. I mean, that's the whole point of that pivot. It that needs to be totally yes. free. Yes, yes, but because of the 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 ability to kind of take this. You know, being able to control the diameter of this in a even in a small sort of a way, it allows you to make that to give you a, the friction type fit that you want or don't want. You follow what I'm saying? I what I ended up doing is I, I I wanted it. I looked at it in the car. I put it in the car and I started flexing the chassis and stuff and saying, okay, I don't want it to go. I don't want it to flex all the way one way and then not come back. Follow what I'm saying? Yes. I didn't want it to be so tight that it wouldn't come back. I wanted it to always want it to find itself back. Okay. Kind of like a kind of like you would do with your uh your the post on your guide where you you know you don't want your guide to fly all over one side and get stuck there. You want it to come back to its center line. Okay. So that's okay. and and the idea behind it is sort of okay, you have to. You have to control that by the way that you're putting the thing together. Okay. But that 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 front pivot point, the T piece, what do you want to call that? When you put that in, like the one on the left, and, and assemble it, essentially, that needs to spin freely like a bushing. Yes, exactly. That's a good that's a good analogy, Jim. It's sort that's, of that's exactly what I was trying to establish. So so there is no torsional control. Should be that. zero. It should be zero torsional control. Which you means, put that pieces which means you've got no torsional control at all. And correct. So you you pretty much will need some kind of. Well, I I don't, or, I don't agree with that. You have torsional control in the chassis. You don't have it in the pot. Okay. You know, you follow what I'm saying? The chassis okay. is well, gonna. The, the good thing is, though, you could buy five or six of them. You can glue one. Then you could put heavy grease in one, light grease in another, and you could do it all that way. Yeah. You like More functions. Down the road, and you might want to think about on the T-piece, the, basically the male end that goes in, cut some grooves in there to allow grease to, to be trapped in there like Courtney's talking about. And Garth could sell up, 14 of them. I ended up using... Uh, 
a really small, slight amount of super loop on the on the two. Okay, and that seemed to work really, really nice. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it. Uh, I was I think I got a little lucky to tell you honestly, the cigar truth. But yeah, you're right, Courtney. But the, see, the idea is. I don't know, maybe you could come up with a whole bunch of different versions of this with different diameters. You know what I mean? To, you know, well, this we tube is keep... like X diameter. What if it was twice as big? Okay, you know what I mean? And, and well, the, the other thing, if, if, if you want to control the torsion, is you know where you've got the little set screws to hold the, 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 uh, the weight in? Put those on the top of that so you could capture the, uh, the male end at various places along the along that bar and change the torsional rigidity of it if you wanted to do that. And I can fill it with tungsten. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, at some point, uh, I'm going to send a few of these out to a select few people to see what they can do with them. So I only, so I need to I only keep ordered... loose. Excuse me? I believe you will also need to keep the two front screws loose. No, I totally disagree. Well, if, the, uh, if there is a suspension spring on the back two mounting positions and you actuate the suspension, then you're going to cause a, uh, uh, a, a cantilever in the tube. There's, not gonna, there's never going to be a cantilever in the tube. It's, it's SLS nylon. It's... It's stiff as, you know. He just means the force is being applied, not. That's right. I mean, the force is, if you move the suspension at the back, you don't want the, the front piece to stay horizontal and the back go up at an angle. Otherwise, you'll cause a, a, a binding in the twist motion. Well, that would be, that would be you're in the tuning of the car on the screws of yes. the car. Correct. Yes, it could be that's, a case of keeping the front uh, screws a little looser. I think. Okay. Well, that's tuning one hundred and one. You know. So. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, I totally disagree with that. I want those firm, and that's why I want to shave some material off the back mount to give the pot a, a, a little space to rock. That that absolutely is a, a good. I think that's a good idea, Jim. And I think that uh, even even if it was just the original pot with just this, you know, the I beam version in here. That still might be a good idea. You know, be to have the pod, you know, be able to have adjustment on the, that pod. We'll see. Okay. But anyways, that's the newest version of the uh, crazy outlaw pod. I, I like it. I like this. Good work, guys. Yeah. Yeah, so, Greg, I think you were referring to something like this. All right. Hold on. God damn it. Stop jumping around. Uh, no, that's an avant slot pod. That's a what? That's an avant slot pod. Yeah, that that, that twists around that uh, that ball. The there, ball uh, end, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. A, that's another version. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. How is so that? The, the fly pod has a ball on the front of the pod and a socket mounted on the chassis, and the socket's got a kind of rubber a rubbery insert inside it. All right, uh, Greg. Uh, Hold on, hold on, John's got one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's got a fly one. Yeah. So turn the car a little bit so the the front is pointing at us, not the rear. There oh, I see. Yeah. It goes way up there. And it's, yeah. Does that does that, that you can so hold on, Garth. So right there, the 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 cap has been removed, right? So you can see the yeah. ball in the socket, but there's right. a cap that goes over top of that with two screws to keep it from popping upward out of the socket. Okay, but otherwise it's it's allowed to rotate and tilt. Sort of like the hitch is the same right? idea, right? It's sort of pretty same. much, pretty much similar. But one of the reasons that works so well is because it's the the rear pod lugs are suspended with springs. The cars come with three sets of different spring hardnesses, so you can tune that. I this can't. Is, even, uh, I have not tried it without springs, but I would not expect. One thing. One thing about this guy is. It is spit light, okay. I mean, it's really light. There, there's hardly any weight to it at all. What I was, what I was about to say before the examples shown was that your design provides 
a, a fairly wide variety of tuning options because you can if somebody wanted to they could they could just force those pieces together without creating rotation and allowing it to be the torsion like your original one piece pod yes or they could, or they could sand down the post so that it's a slip fit with some lubricant or they could sand it down even more so it's basically loose front front uh, screws tight front screws loose rear screws tight rear screws loose rear screws with you know silicone washers and or springs or or whatever yeah um, there would be a whole bunch of different sort of spins if not you could come up with them. yeah so hope, looking forward to uh, what your testers come up with <laughs> any other questions for garth moving on mike what you got oh that was what i was talking oh, okay. about uh, one other thing, though, you, you could uh, drill a, drill the potholes out so they're not screw retention, but they hit and put a springs on it for adjustable spring suspension in the same way that slotted does. Yeah. So you could do that same same thing with that, and it's essentially a triangular pod at that point with a with a easily rotated front suspension movement. Yep. So, okay, that's all. All right, Chuck, what you got? Is uh, is this mic going to work? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Um, there's a new uh, track that opened up a couple weeks ago in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, south of Dallas and Oak Cliff. Uh, on Facebook, uh, the guy has it as Road Trip, and I believe his name is Brett. Uh, but he opened up a, uh, a new, a new uh, track. Uh, it's composed of two... Um, Carrera Digital 132 tracks that people can go in and pay some money to for some time or race and uh, try to beat the track, the lap records and stuff. Uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, he only does it on weekends. He's got a regular job uh, to do that. I've got one picture if I can remember how to to share my screen here. I don't remember. <laughs> share screen at the bottom of the Zoom window, then you'll get a pop up. There it is. There it is. Share. Okay. Choose the window with the pictures you want to share, and then click share again at the bottom of that window. All right. Can there you all go. see uh, this? It's a young man and a uh, and his dad came in to visit while I was there. Out there on the March the tenth, that was his opening weekend. Uh, they opened up on the ninth, and uh, this was on the Sunday. Uh, but uh, this is I should have taken more pictures. This is all I've got. Uh, but he. Uh, uh, he has it opened up uh, for weekend. Uh, I think it's um, it's like noon to eight on Saturday, noon to uh, six on Sunday. Uh, but he's got a bunch of cars. Uh, he's got controllers. Basically, just uh, come in and pick a car out and run it on the track. And it's uh, typical digital digital stuff. He's got the um, kind of see the screen and uh, the display screen in the upper part of the picture. Uh, but he's got one on either end for each track. Uh, the two tracks are kind of end to end. And so uh, gives you a, gives you an idea of, of what he's got going. But it's uh, it's interesting that uh, they've got some something new in the DFW area, and it's, and it's kind of fun. I'm trying to find the Facebook group, but apparently I'm not using the right words for it. Yeah, road trip mm -hmm. in two words. And it's, yeah, it's a little hard to find. Uh, I was looking for it earlier. And uh, do, you, do you have, uh, do you have it in your history or in your um, or anything? I've got it. Feeling? I've got it right here. Uh, okay. Share, share your Facebook. Okay. I will do that. As long as there's nothing risque on there. <laughs> Not usually. Let's or just copy a link to that group and paste it in the chat. Yeah, the link should be the link should be up there, and uh, but I'll I'll stick it in chat. Facebook.com slash can't read it. <laughs> it's ro road trip DFW is the uh, there you go. Okay, link. that's what we needed to know. Road trip DFW. But I was kind of hoping he would, uh, I think he, he was mentioned or noticed on uh, one of the other uh, slot car groups. And I was hoping maybe he'd show up on here. I, 
since he works during the week, probably not this week, but uh, you know maybe on a on the the later time spot he might show up. Hopefully, he, hopefully he will. I got dogs fighting behind me. <laughs> so okay, I got, probably, you already got it too. There. Yeah, and you put the link there, so definitely we'll be able to find that. So if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area and you're interested, hit that link. I'll go ahead and I'll paste it into the YouTube. Uh, chat stuff as well. <clears throat> uh, yeah, looks like a nice place. I like that he painted the track, so you can get better better tire hookup. Is he was he doing basically magnet cars for everybody? Or yeah, it is magnet cars. Uh, uh, at, at least at this point, I guess you can bring your own car in uh, if you want to. He's got it. The cars uh, sh uh, displayed on the wall, and you just pick the one you want to try. And uh, it's it's a pretty cool setup, I think. Looks like fun. Thanks for sharing. Uh, all right, Jim, you got your hand up again. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a friend of mine looking for racing in the DFW area? Is there any other? He's. I, I don't think he's interested in digital like that, but is there any 30 second scale racing that you know of in the area? There is. Uh, there's something in the in mid cities area. One of the guys here uh, was has talked about it before, but there's also a uh, a commercial track, one thirty second, one twenty fourth, over in Mesquite. Uh, just, I think it's just called Dallas uh, Slot Car Racing, if I remember right. Uh, there's also a Facebook group for that, uh, but that the those are the only uh, ones that I know of at this point. And I forget the name of the guy who is. Uh, I think he's he's either either in Irving or Grand Prairie or someplace uh, in the mid cities that uh, has a has slot great slot club. Uh, but I forget, I forget who that was. Yeah, if you can throw some links up or something, because uh, the, the guy that I know is, is named Rudy Gariga. He is the owner of Slick 7 products, and he was racing 30-second scale with us, but he moved to Dallas about six months ago. Ah, okay. He, he was looking. I'll put, I'll put a link uh, for as soon as I find it for the, uh, for the Mesquite track, and then... Uh, I'll try to see if I can remember. I would think Greg could remember the guy uh, that that mentioned uh, that they had some uh, a club in the in the Dallas Fort Worth area. No, that good? no, <laughs> Not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I don't remember. I, I did a quick search on Facebook for Dallas uh, slot cars, and I found a group <clears throat> for Dallas Texas slot car 132 scale racers, but. Uh, there hasn't been any activity for four years and ah. it's showing Carrera digital. So probably not the one that you're talking about. Mm -mm. Uh, but yeah, I'll, look, I'll, look, I'll get a link on. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. That'd be cool. So why not in Mesquite is Dallas Oh, that's easy enough. Yeah. 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 That's Jay and Chantel Howard's place. It's pretty nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have a, a big flat track and a, and a small oval, I think. And a drag strip. I'm just pasting links all over the place here. That looks like a nice thing going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one of the only places I've ever heard of that had a king track and then sold it and replaced it with a flat track. And uh, they actually have more racers and more and more um, activity now than they ever did on the King Track. Any idea why? Probably because they don't <laughs> do run people... twelve or opens anymore. <laughs> they don't run. They don't run all that other stuff anymore. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, they they managed to to uh, what should we say revive their retro racing a lot by getting the flat track because the king track just you know was too quick and it was a and it was a, a horsepower um, circuit that people were stopping people were just giving up because they were chasing motors and chasing power all the time and wing car racing in any case is is a very very small piece of any slot car racehorse business these days because it's so expensive. 
That looks like they race every Thursday, Saturday. Yep, yep. every Thursday and Saturday. There's a lot of drag racing going on, obviously. Pro tree bracket. <clears throat> Pro tree bracket, yeah. Here you go, NASCAR LMP. NASCAR on the LMP. Oh, it's electric stuff. There you go. Yeah. And and where there's one of those, there's probably a half a dozen home tracks that nobody <laughs> knows about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all righty. Anything else, Chuck? That's all for me. I would like to say that uh, people come from all over to go to that uh, Mesquite track. Uh, some, some of the guys I talked with when I, the one time I visited said they drove for like an hour and a half to get there. So it's uh, kind of unique for the area. Cool. <clears throat> all righty. Any other show and tell? Guess we're moving on to Club Corner. Raise your hand for Club Corner if you want to talk about slot car racing. And hopefully the dogs don't decide to have a fight right while I'm talking. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what Dewan would like to talk about. <laughs> you got a bunch of racing in this weekend. Take it away. Uh, you have no idea, do you, Greg? Not, not all of it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm uh, calling myself Have Control, Will Travel. <laughs> So we were supposed to have our um, traditional uh, um, Firehouse Slot Car Club uh, race on Saturday, but uh, the location has, it's in a the shed that's uh, out in the backyard, and we usually set up outside under um, canopies and things like that. And for Southern California, one of those really rare things that's been going on there steadily, um, they've had uh, rain. <laughs> And it's not conducive of our uh, um, being able to go outside and uh, and do what we normally do. So we had to cancel that one on Saturday. So I decided to get my, uh, um, I guess, my shot of slot car racing in on Sunday. Um, they had a special uh, tribute um, race that they do every every fourth Sunday at Big Lou's Big on Lou. behalf of yeah, okay, big one. Yeah, on behalf of Robert Silva. What? Yeah, Robert Silva? Did I get the right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I signed up and uh, went down there. They had two two races. One was the GT3s um, using um, a, well, a variety of manufacturers. Um, pretty open format. Well, not open. Not too open. A, a lot more flexible than the Far Out Club, let's put it that way. Um, and then the second race was uh, F1s. Um, SRF ones. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, fell victim of the uh, air, tra air, air travel uh, blues, which we had a, a problem with one of our a part of the plane. So I missed the first. I, I was three and a half hours late getting off the ground and missed the first race. And uh, the second race, I just got there, no practice and everything. So it was it was still fun. But nonetheless, I didn't quite uh, uh, perform well. So finished the last of the group. Well, a kind of last of the group. We did have a DNF. Somebody didn't finish. So that kind of salvaged my last place, my traditional last place finish. <laughs> so I didn't quite get that bad. Did you get any pictures? Unfortunately, I did not. I was rushing and I didn't take any pictures of it. And I was trying to find some. Uh, it was posted. But I couldn't find any. Uh, it might be some of the big loons. I didn't get a chance to, to go over to his Facebook group to see if he had captured anything. But uh, it was, uh, I think it was last, well, I don't know if it was last year or not, actually. I got this so late. But um, so that was my uh, first adventure. That was uh, um, Sunday's activities. And since I was in LA and found that the travel from LA to other areas was more convenient uh, for me to. Uh, I decided to stay the night and make a trip up to Seattle, Washington, the Tacoma area, and uh, visit the uh, um, IMSA. Got to get my thing here. Yeah, the IMSA. Um, there we go. You guys can see that. <laughs> yeah, visit the IMSA um, here we go. club. Monday. <laughs> a couple of familiar people in that race. Um, is uh, <laughs> at Russ's place. This is his track. Russ is uh, right there next to Greg to the far left. And then Greg Gobb. 
happened to be there, of course. And that was part of the reason why I went by there. And it was a nice little group, 12, 12 guys, including myself. And this track is phenomenal. Um, uh, I mean, he has the scenery. It's uh, probably just uh, just shy of what uh, uh, Stephen Parr Jones would, would have. But nonetheless, it's quite a bit of scenery floating around there. I've got a few pictures of some of the scenery out. Well, that's the uh, and he had a phenomenal spread. Oh my goodness! His his, um, his wife and his mother in law just put together uh, one of the tastiest meals. <laughs> As some of the screen shot, as, uh, scenery shots, uh, some of the activities. I didn't take a lot. I was kind of worn out. <laughs> I was very fatigued to work around with some nostalgic. Uh, um, the center. jukebox actually worked too. Yes, yes, it was working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. So cool. I love it. And uh, this was uh, the actual race. Oh, I thought I had this. Oh, it is. Oh. That's that's basically what I got. I got a Well, I was trying to showcase the uh, the, the format of the race and that the uh, rest uses a uh, um, uh, fueling system, the analog track, of course, but uh, um, he uses a fuel simulation uh, with this race management system. And if you saw at the very beginning, quite a few of the cars were stalled underneath the, the, the light bridge there. And, um, well, anyway. I can't. Anyway, that's how it was. It was very entertaining and very challenging uh, process to to keep track of. Not very challenging, but you know, you, you really have to be on your toes um, dealing with the uh, the fueling. Otherwise, uh, as many people throughout the night, uh, you run out of fuel and you stop in the middle of the race, and that's it for that that uh, that heat. So anyway, that's kind of it was great. I enjoyed making that trip out there and. Um, Probably we may uh, pick up uh, um, some other notable sites that uh, are around the country that I can tend to go to if it makes, it makes sense. And the scheduling hooks up. I might try to hit some San other Jose. Places. San Jose. <laughs> that weekend I have a conflict. I really I, I'd love to go to the the, the Rio Slot uh, Challenge that you guys have. No, just come to yeah. San Jose. Oh. <laughs> okay. So speaking of the the fueling and everything at Russ's track, uh, that race was also his trophy run, and so he had trophies made for first, second, and third place, and a special trophy for the person who ran out of fuel the most often. <laughs> so, the the, so basically, every time somebody ran out of fuel, -race, they got a little tick mark and next to their name. <laughs> And then at the end of the night, the guy who had the most tick marks got basically a gas pump with a little plug. Yes. on it. Yeah, little that's cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool, yeah. Like a trophy with a gas, a gas tank, a gas uh, pump. Yeah, that was really nice. So, uh, he, he does put on a show. He's a nice host. Yep. Yeah, and yep. he's 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 renowned for the spread of food. You you just don't have dinner before you go to a race at Russ's. Just because you know, just don't. <laughs> there's always there's always extra food at the end of the night, even if everybody's there and chow, chowing down, yeah. chili and pizza and sandwiches and you know. Yeah. yeah. So my my goal my car wasn't uh, really up to stuff. Uh, I didn't realize they had uh, different kind of tires and so i just was just there having fun and trying to stand everybody's way and not ruin their races for them because it, it wasn't the, the last heat of their uh that that um um, um the, the cars they were running so i, I but it was fun yeah it, your car actually held up a lot better than i thought it would <laughs> yeah, it was a it's kind of hard to compete against cars mm -hmm. with foam tire foam rubber tires on it with stock rubber tires but yeah. Yeah, you're doing good. I was out there just trying to get out of everybody's way. <laughs> good times. 
Okay. That's a you were running on some types? We, yeah, we run scale auto foam rubber sometimes. Oh, okay. And I didn't know it. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> Interesting. That's, that's a, we can talk about that because there's, there's a movement down here as well to start using foam tires. They have fantastic grip. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and we don't use, we don't put glue on the track or anything like that or on the tires. We use the scale auto tire cleaner, which is basically lighter fluid, uh, to give them a little bit of extra grip <clears throat> on race night. But otherwise, yeah, they're, they're great. They, they get good traction on pretty much everything. It's electric track and wood track. And we don't race it. We don't use them on everything, but I'd say probably one out of every three series as we have is using those tires, either white. And, white and do you allow uh, people to use the different compounds or is it one compound? We usually specify whether it's going to be whites or yellows. We haven't run, I don't think we've ever run reds yet. Um, but yeah, we, we, the spec, the, the tire is spec to the specific okay. compound. <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Yeah, because when, when the, um, when Ivan Bassas, the, the owner of Scale Auto, was down at Electric Dreams for the Scale Auto Festival, he brought a bunch of those tires with him and we ran some of the, we ran a couple of scale auto formula ones on the electric dreams track with those with those foam tires and they ran wonderfully and then the guys were trying those same foam tires at piranha raceway on the new flat track there with 132nd scale cars and they ran incredibly well there too uh there's kind of a movement down here because it's simple you know you buy them take them out the pack and put them on the car and go yep yeah, yeah pretty much no other than i i run those on those foam tires on my little alpha t33s because nothing else will give it traction you know there's no way to get any decent traction on them and they run really really fast uh on my track with those if, mm -hmm. if they're prepped with this cleaner, either the yellows or the though well, the whites actually have too much traction. Yeah, the whites are the softest, I think. Yeah, yeah, the yellow ones run the best. Oh. I might try. Cool. Next time I'll read the memo. I'll, I'll read the specifications a little bit closer. <laughs> you, know, you can always just say, "Hey, Greg, what do I got to do to my car? <laughs> Put these tires on. That's it." <laughs> All right. Jim's got his hand up. What's up, Jim? Well, we had an interesting race this last Saturday, and um, I'm kind of known for my crazy ass ideas. And this was an idea I came up with a, with a buddy of mine, Brent, you see, holding up the first annual TFX trifecta race. And the reason it's called trifecta is it's three races in one day. It was originally going to be three venues, but one of our uh, uh, hosts had to back out at the last minute because of a, a a medical thing, nothing serious, but a medical thing. And so it turned out to be still three races on three tracks, but two venues, but still in one day. And you can see the cars there. The, this is an HO race. Uh, the cars were OS3 because they were pretty much spec cars with a couple of uh, uh, allowable modifications and a spec body. Uh, we weighed the bodies. They had, went through, had to go through tech. And so they were weighed to make sure that there was not grinding on the bodies and stuff like that. These are the three tracks. Uh, the first track is in the upper left and the, uh, the bottom two tracks are at one location, uh, but two different tracks. So those are the three tracks that we ran on. This was an all day thing. It was, it was a blast. Uh, here's our tech inspection. After your car went through tech, you were given a, a, a you know, a card, a lane card, whatever you want to call it. And so we had all the cars in park for May, and then we lined them all up on the track for the first race. Again, these are all uh, spec Camaro bodies on a spec chassis with limited modifications. Uh, we had some incidents. We did run a, uh, before the first race and the second race, we ran an IROC as well. So this is an IROC, kind of a support race, if you want to call it that. Uh, this was with some Viper jets with uh, hard bodies. And after the first race, we made a 20-minute trip over to the second venue. 
The second venue started off with an IROC race, and we ran the uh, Team Sacramento IROC Frey Cars set. So that was before race two of the TFX trifecta. Uh, each race in the trifecta was uh, started with qualifying. So we qualified to sort the mains, and then there were there was an A main, a B main, uh, was I think there was a C main in one one event, um, and there were move ups. So you could qualifying didn't really matter in that you could move up and still win the the overall heat. And that is the black track in use in qualifying. And then the blue track was used uh, as the last race of the trifecta. And the winner turned out to be Mark. Mark in the center, uh, Mitch on the left, the owner of the two tracks that we ran on, and Sean in third, the owner of the first track. And so we had a great group. We limited, this was a Sacramento only thing. You know, we have 20 or 25 people typically in Northern California that may go to a bigger, big HO race, but this was limited to 12 because of uh, three races in, in one day. We had to limit it. So we limited this to the Sacramento group only. And so these are all Sacramento area people. And so we limited it to 12 because the one track is four lanes, the other track is two lanes. And it worked great. And we had an absolute blast. Uh, I, you know, if you got tracks that are close to you, pick a class and do something like this because everybody just had a blast. It was a great day of racing. So, Jim, that doesn't look like your your typical snap together HO track. No, these are all for uh, uh, routed. These are all made by Brad Bowman. If you're familiar with the HO scene, uh, he makes fully routed HO tracks. So the one was a four lane track. It's five by sixteen. The other two are six lane fray style tracks with that are six by fourteen. Wow, and they so, look really they look really nice. Yeah, they're they're if you've used to running on a plastic track, this is like a whole different world. And we have about I think six or seven of those in the Sacramento area that are all fully routed four to six lane tracks. So we've got HO racing is going great in Sacramento area. They're not cheap tracks. I mean, they're two or three thousand dollars a piece. You know, they're not super expensive, but they're not they're not like put together a couple hundred dollars worth of plastic track. But then again, they're not like plastic track. If if you've never run an HO car on a smooth track and it goes down the straightaway and it's not click, 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 it's amazing. I can attest to that at uh, from going to the coral. And I I I was like, you know, I, I could have like a two foot by four foot and see, you know, just pop it out when I want to play with an HO car. And then I went to uh, Viper and looked at their uh, pricing and their, their two by four options. I think I can, I think I can hold off for now. <laughs> <laughs> Even a two foot by four foot routed, you know, built track is. It's about 600, wasn't it, Greg? About 700. Two by four? And that's not including shipping. <laughs> and those don't, those aren't going to ship cheap. Yeah, Viper sells them in kits at about half the price if you want to rail them yourself, which is not hard, but it's extremely tedious. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw, I, I remember seeing Mike walking around with a little block on this track. And like, these are, these are tracks that have been already gone through that process. And he's still going around with a little block, checking to make sure all the rails are perfect before starting the heats and races and stuff. Yeah, no, not interested. <laughs> I don't want to play with my HO cars on a routed track that badly. <clears throat> All righty, thank you, Jim. And Mike's got his hand up. Go ahead, Mike. Well, we had our usual couple races this week, and I uh, we had one for Can Am race, and I forget the other one, but I had a good weekend um, or a good week and took home trophies on both of them. So felt good about that, but it was good fun. Very close races this time. It was, uh, it was really, really close uh, within, I think the, the end of both of them were within two laps, all three of us. So that was a good thing. It's good fun. Uh, don't have the videos up. They will be up shortly, however, today. So that's all. Okie dokie. Oh, for really? those of oh, I was going to say for those of uh, of a critical nature, uh, the reason I ran the uh, chaparral without the wing was not so much for performance, but because I couldn't find the uprights. <laughs> it's like where the heck did they go? <laughs> I've got a whole 
box full of body parts and they were in there, but they're not now. So I don't know what happened to them. So we'll see. Such a shame. <laughs> All right. yes. All right. It's a pretty car even without the wing. It is. What you got, Jeremy? Hey, uh, Iowa model area racers. We had our race in beautiful Stanwood, Iowa. And let me see if I can share this. We again had nine racers there, and we doubled the population of Stanwood for the day. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Um, maybe. So this was Pioneer Legends. Uh, this was our first time really racing them. Uh, competitively and everything was pretty good like this little blue car here only had rubber tires on it while everybody else had silicones so it was a little bit of a different experience for him uh, that is it we have a race coming up in two weeks so if you're in Iowa please stop by Dewan that includes you <laughs> not sure why you'd be out here in Iowa but if you are feel free He's got, a, he's got a sugar daughter with a free plane fare. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you just feel like some corn on the cob. Yeah. <laughs> we have pork, too, and cows, so it's not just corn. I'm a vegetarian. Okay, you're disinvited. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis, you're, you're next. Hey, uh, tonight is the bi-monthly um, race at Piranha for uh, brushless cars. So we now have a wow. series going where we use these cars. Um, they are ready to runs that you can buy from uh, Mid America Raceway in Chicago. Uh, they come with a pre painted body. That's not it. The pre painted body was this one, and I've just changed it over for the same body in my own colors. So at least I know which car I'm driving. Um, it's an old uh, Champion TurboFlex chassis uh, with a 3000 kV dose slot motor and a dose slot control board. And we run them uh, out of the box with only a, ch a change of rear tire diameter because the tires are very big when you first get them. And so we change, do we allow the guys to cut them down a little? Still maintaining a, a, a 062 clearance underneath at the back. Uh, and then you can basically flatten the chassis and uh, you can change from, from body clips to pins like I've done. Uh, you've got to keep the same gear ratio, you've got to run the same guide, you've got to run one particular type of tire and that particular body. And this, they're not terribly fast. They're about a second a lap or so slower than our um, LMP cars on the same track. But man, are they fun. They're so equal. And there is such a, it, it's such tight competition that you, you really have to be on it. You've got to concentrate. You can't come out. You've got to be, Absolutely on the limit, or at 99.9% .9 all the time. Um, it's pretty hard work to to, uh, to to come out on top, but uh, really fun. So that's what's happening tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I won the last one. I'm going to certainly try and win the next one. What are those ready to run uh, um, cost out of, you know? Um... They retail at $139.99. Mm -hmm. Yes, nice. And so, uh, you know, and it, like I say, it's, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, they do benefit from a little bit of, of work. Uh, they've obviously been assembled, uh, like most production cars and they need a little bit of work to, for example, make sure that the rear bushings are well aligned because they're soldered in and, um, you often need to just readjust that soldering a little bit so that they, so that the axles turn nice and easy. Uh, make sure that everything's, uh, you know, uh, level and flat. The, the chassis are a little bit uh, twisted sometimes. So, you know, to do a little bit, you need to do a little bit of work there. 
Um, and then after that, that's about it. That's all you're allowed to do. And uh, it's really all you need to do. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're looking forward to it. We had, I think, seven guys the last time, but we're looking at substantially more tonight. I think it's probably going to be 11 or 12 of us tonight. And that's 124 scale, right? 124 scale, yes. Yeah, it's a, apparently an Audi body, but they, uh, it didn't look like any Audi I've ever seen. But um, uh, that's what they that's what they call it. Um, but it's one of the the, um, the European style uh, DTM body, European stock car racing style uh, DTM bodies. Uh, it all works very well. So that's me. All righty. Floor is open. All right, we're going to end the show now. <laughs> Anybody I want see to Karsten on the, on the call yeah, today. Good Karsten to have you back. Yuna's here. And Karsten as well. Yep. Good to see him. <laughs> Any, anything new in the software, Karsten? Yeah, oh. muted. Not muted, but his mic isn't working. Oh, his mic not working. I might have to come back to Carson. What you got your hand up for, uh, Mr. Weber? Uh, that that uh, hysterical video we discussed earlier. Yeah. Since you mentioned it, uh, this is oh, a. Yeah. A DVD picked up from eBay. I think it was six dollars, eight dollars, or something like that. And uh, uh, it's really good as far as uh, seeing, uh, you know, moving pictures of real Can-Am cars. I don't know if there's anything wrong with uh, the vintage Can-Am cars that they have. Most of those are, I guess, real Can-Am cars. Put together, but uh, this this DVD was produced uh, and released in 2008. But they use uh, eight millimeter film. They use uh, images, moving images from lots of different kinds of formats, mediums and formats. Film, eight millimeter, Super Eight. 16 millimeter, super 16. I think there's some 35 millimeter film in it. And it, there's lots of different formats of video also in, in that uh, era was taking place where people were actually using video for uh, shooting stuff like this. And, it, and some of it's amateur, you know, but still uh, the, uh, the quality is really pretty good. And uh, there are some images here that I had never seen before in what sense. And the only thing you miss is the thump in the chest from the, the uh, yeah. eight liter engines going by. Um, Need bigger speakers for that. <laughs> yeah. Especially, yeah. Okay. And that, that's all I have. Thank you. So if anybody sees one of those in a pile at a, at a you know, swap meet, swap meet, or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or on eBay or whatever. Yeah, pick it up. If you still got a DVD player, of course. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, DVD players yeah. will run on most computers, USB, they have with USB uh, adapters. Yeah. And then, uh, I think they're like. $17 for a DVD player. They are becoming a lot less common these days, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you get the DVD, then you can feel okay about pirating an electronic version of it. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jeremy. You got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about a topic. Uh, in our club, for the first time at the last race, we kind of had real tech inspections. So we have six classes that we bring that day. We have six classes for group A and six classes for group, group B, whatever you bring. And so we rolled a dice and number six came up and that was Pioneer Legends were tech and 
you know, everybody passed, no problem. But one of the things is that some people in other classes weren't up to rules. Uh, they had the wrong motor in or the wrong gear. And to them, it was, you know, it's not a big deal. But then if you've got a 27 tooth and I got a 28 tooth, you're definitely catching more speed, you know, on the back end. So it, since it was, we've always had kind of a gentleman's agreement, you know, hey, nobody's going to cheat. We're not going to cheat, you know. And if you saw somebody cheating, you could call them out. But it was the first time we had a real tech inspection. And for me personally, I was like, oh, this is great. I, I loved it uh, personally. And it, but it, it definitely harbored some bad feelings. Like I know two guys in the club are not at all happy. And they're like, well, I don't want to race if we're going to be a bunch of rules uh, lawyers. And and, and how, do you, how do you guys deal with that in your club? Or is it, do you guys welcome it? Do you guys do more relaxed racing? Uh, for my club, I mean, we do we do have rules and specs, and but it is more of a gentleman's agreement kind of thing. Um, if if anybody is that dog is not happy with your rules, dogs aren't that. Happy. Just <laughs> uh, it's rare for somebody somebody to be accused of cheating, but before every series, we pretty much do a basic tech. You know, it's it's understood that your cars are going to be examined at you know at the very least before we start a series to weigh it and check magnetic downforce and you know give it a once over and you know make sure it's not obviously using you know different gear ratios and different motors and and different tires and other things that are not allowed for that particular series. But yeah, if somebody if somebody is found to have out of spec parts, we basically just say, uh -oh. we just assume they don't realize it, right? And just say, you know, you need to change this bit so that you, so that your, your points count, so that you get to keep your, keep your progress from this race. If you, if you don't change it, then you just don't get points for this race. And if it's like super out of whack, then we're like, no, we're we're gonna let you borrow a car that's in spec or something. We're not going to let somebody put down a car that's just crazy out of spec. Um, but yeah, it's, oh, yeah. It's, we, we, we scrapped his points for that race. And yeah. then I'm not a rules marshal, but I sent him a link to what he needs to buy to get back into compliance. Yeah. You know, just stuff like that. But I was just curious how, if other clubs are a little more strict, a little more loose, how it goes. I, think I mean, the main reason is for, for that situation is that, it hasn't already been happening consistently and now now you you guys started doing it <laughs> and so yeah. they're like well we, we weren't you know why weren't we doing this before they weren't used to it right yeah. maybe they maybe they were maybe they were cheating maybe they were just out of spec and you know they didn't care but getting upset about it is is kind of hints that they knew that they were <laughs> <laughs> they knew that they were getting an, a, an edge somehow. Yeah. Yeah, we, we check them not real closely, but in a lot of our classes are spec motor, spec gears. So I always check to make sure that they have the right gears and the right motor in it. We've only had to DQ one person that I recall in the past year or so. And it was kind of a kind of not his fault kind of thing he was running one of the one of the ford escorts that had a 12 tooth pinion on it and it came that way and i get it he was told multiple times that it didn't come that way but he ran it anyway so we dq'd him uh, other than that I, I do hear a lot of people say well i'm not going to win anyway so what difference does it make and to me that's just a bunch of bs uh, you're beating the people in your peer group. If you're a middle pack runner and you're running illegally you're beating the other middle pack runner because you're running illegally so to me, that excuse is just BS. Oh, yeah, and and if you allow it for one person who's mid packer, then a guy who's upper mid pack yeah. is going to do it, and then he's going to be in the up. For, you're right. I mean, you can't exactly. let it go for one person. Like even though, no matter how bad they are, you can't let that go. Yeah. Usually, I found that the ones that squawk the loudest are the ones that are not following the rules, and they know they're not following. The rules. They know it. They're they're hoping. Nobody, either they won't get called on it, or if they squawk too loud and threaten to leave and never come back, that they'll get away with. You know. Yeah. I, I don't understand. The door. The, I don't understand the thinking, but that's the way I think. 
So that that was my idea of to roll a dice and figure out what we're going to inspect that day instead of doing the whole thing. But my thought there was that if you don't know what class is going to be inspected today, you're probably going to keep all six cars in line and because you don't know if you're trying to cheat in class four and if four comes up, well, now you're screwed. So hopefully that works. We'll see how it goes the rest of the season. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, I got that from the 24 hours of lemons race where they, they pick one of the cars and smash it before it's, the race starts. So you don't spend over $5,000 on it. <laughs> but you don't know who's going to race that day. Yeah, I think it's I think it's five hundred bucks. You can't spend more than okay. five hundred. Yeah, five hundred. Yeah. I know it was something crazy. I just thought that was a funny rule. You show up to race, yeah. you're cheating, and your car gets smashed. <laughs> Actually, I don't think if it's your cheat, they just randomly pick one. They do. They, one yeah. contestant will be given five hundred bucks that day. Yeah, exactly. You get your five hundred bucks. That's yeah. why you're not spending five thousand, I guess. Yeah, and the other thing too is if you win, uh, you get the prize money in nickels. Nice. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I, I was asked to run in that, and there was no bloody way I was going to do it. So my buddy went, and they actually won with a Toyota Toyota Supra that they got for five hundred bucks. And then everybody was pissed because they were Canadian. <laughs> well, that goes without saying, John. <laughs> Did they get paid in Canadian nickels? <laughs> no, that's why everybody was upset. We made thirty percent right off the top. <laughs> nobody, had a, nobody had a truck big enough to haul that many vehicles. Yeah, well, think of the—I mean, our the profit margin for these guys was huge because they they got the car for five hundred Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so every like you know you get paid in you know U.S. nickels and paid when oh no no everybody was just upset. <laughs> they needless to say they weren't invited back. <laughs> well, you guys might get a kick out of this, so I'll go ahead and share the screen. This is uh, the newest guy in the club building the track. I showed you the layout a few a couple weeks ago. This is that track. Uh, and there's a couple of, oh, gosh darn it. Got a video here. What up, Greg? <laughs> Checked out. I'm gonna have to redo some wires and clean it up, but just to see it work, there it is on the laptop. I bought this splitter to see on two big ass TVs. Here, let me uh so yeah well not cool. I'm seeing the <laughs> seeing the scores yeah. uh here's working on the wiring. Uh, I hate that. Yeah, man. yeah that's a good that's a good picture of it. And he's still that's he's still doing more to the track. Yes. Yeah. I think that's going to be fun. Yeah. Basically, how, how big is it for the footprint? You know, uh, it is eight by sixteen, I think. Eighteen by two. Yeah. It'll be eighteen if it's. Yeah. No, it's full sheets. There weren't any half sheets, so it's it's sixteen. It's not twenty. I don't think. Oh, I I could probably get the. Get the layout up but anywho uh yeah so he did he did drive a car around on one of these here we go gave him a hard time for doing it as a vertical video <laughs> mm -hmm. and just listening to the the pattern of motor sound it sounds like it's got good flow. So, sounds like it's going to be a fun one. Yeah. Got a couple of blip blips, blip blip, and then longer. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Great layout. Very nice. Looking forward to driving around on that. <laughs> modified, modified blue king layout. Modified king, yeah. Seem to remember you said that when you were showing us the design. Yeah, the, the original intent was to be as close to a, a Blue King as possible, but then there was so much wasted space on that big rectangular table. <laughs> I've done a great job. I think it's very nice. Anybody else? We can just uh, stop and go casual. You guys want to stop and go casual? Sure. Which, what brand of track was that? That is all Skelectric Sport. I want to share one thing in the chat here. Uh, I just sent it to you, Greg. 
this I just had a chance to review these and now I'm going to use them all the time. Uh, it's a wireless HDMI cable that you plug into your TV and then the USB goes into your TV's USB port and then your computer and then you can send your wireless from your like your laptop to your TV across the room wirelessly so you don't got to run cords up the wall and through the ceiling oh, or that's whatever you cool. want. Oh, it's so nice because it works across my entire, you know, two stall garage and I'm not going to run wires anywhere weird now. So wow. anyway, if I don't know if that's if you can where did you get it? I put the link on Amazon. Uh, click on the coupon. I think there's it's like 50 bucks. But anyway, yeah, you plug in if your, t your most TVs have a USB port on the back for service and that's got power. So you just plug that part in there. One says receiver, one says transmitter. There might be cheaper ones. I, for all I know, I just ha happened to review this one. But anyway, for people looking for solutions that they don't want to run HDMI cables around, that might be. I'm I'm using it now and I love it. So cool. Yeah. Okay, so the USB plugs into a USB on your machine for power, and then yeah. the HDMI TX for transmit. Yep. Go to your your, to video your laptop out. port out. And then, yeah. and then the HDMI, you know, HDMI one on your TV. And then when it recognizes it, the computer pulled it up, you know, you, how you can have split monitor, dual monitor, extended monitor. It gives you all of that and it gives you the native resolution of the TV as well as it identified my TV was an LG. So it almost acts like a real display yeah, port it, in that regard. <laughs> yeah, and it, and, it, and it did. I have a seven. 720 720p tv in the garage at 42 inches and it recognized all the resolutions for it so wow. anyway uh i didn't think this technology was around and it just kind of surprised me so well, i'm not surprised but i didn't know it existed either yeah <laughs> super cool oh and i had no no delay or lag either so that was nice I, that's what i was worried about was like the audio beeps but everything's fine so far cool <laughs> Tip of the day. Did I miss? Did I miss something about uh, along the way in the two hundred episodes? Did anybody tackle uh, fiber optic uh, uses in cars and such? In cars? Geo, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's who I would think. <laughs> anybody would have been Geo. Here. I think yes, there. I mean, I, so can... I think Giovanni was running uh, fiber optics through his cars. Oh, I, I thought he was running lots of cable. I mean, you know, tiny, I have no tiny idea. Wires, but you were joking. Anyway, yeah. So I, I, I can see, I can see that kind of thing for scenery, like in a in a building to light up all the different areas of inside something. But I got I mean, this uh, auto art uh, Lamborghini Miura show up. Couple weeks ago, I think it's a used one. In, they had taken all the all the lighting equipment out of it. The auto art, I think, apparently to come with a lot of all of it. So, uh, so anyway, I found somebody online that sells uh, auto art parts. And this is a this is a light kit you can buy to go into that in, into their car as well. You know, they're just light kits. Uh, for five dollars, and the thing was the, the, the Lamborghini Miura light kit only had one headlight. It's like a larger LED, and uh, since the car had been stripped for racing, the, the slot car had been stripped out. How, however, they got that light, that front headlight split to go, you know, to illuminate both headlights. On the front okay, of the car. it was gone. So I don't know how. Just trying to figure out how, how I might be able to do it. And, uh, so it's it's called it's similar to fiber optics in that it's it's called light piping, and it yeah. uses the it uses the same technology or uses the same concept of fiber optics, just not nearly as well because it's it loses so much light out the sides. But I've got some old scale electric cars where it was a, it was a it was a grain of wheat bulb in the center of the car in a little <laughs> metal things because it warmed up so they put it in a little metal thing so it didn't heat up the plastic too much and it then light pipes from there to the front to the headlights <laughs> anyway i decided that one way to do it not be to mess with the fiber optics so i, I bought this cheapo lamp off of something else off of eBay, and it's got lots of it 
you try to buy fiber optic, just the material, it's pretty expensive. The yeah. Little, the little uh, strands. But this was pretty cheap. So I'm going to cut it up and try to figure out some ways to use it. I don't know if anybody missed the fiber optic. You'll I be have. the first that I know of. Okay. How tightly can you bend it, John? Excuse me? How tightly can you bend a corner in it? Very tightly. Very tightly. Yeah? Yep. I mean, it's, it's basically a hair. Uh, oh, my so, word, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't break, then. You can loop it around. No, it's some kind of pretty flexible stuff. It's, it seems to be... Uh, like, it's just broke. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll see. We'll find out. All righty. Looking forward to hearing about that. Anybody else got anything they want to talk about? Uh, I'll mention again the Worldwide Slot Car Chat uh, proxy host form is available via the link in the Zoom chat or the, the YouTube chat or soon in the description of the video. So if you weren't paying attention at the beginning of this <laughs> somehow and you made it this far and you're still listening, which is even less likely, and you want to join in as a host, click the link, fill out the form, send it to me. Uh, I've been struggling to get a consistent uh, data connection to the chat. I, I, I think I may have achieved it, but I've got something to show if you'd like to, if you'd like to take a look. If it's all car related, yeah. I think you can Absolutely it is. <laughs> it happened today. I'm going to share my screen, which is always trickier from the phone. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there goes your go. So if I go home and then pick my he's calling from space. Yeah, <laughs> he's got his video off too, so that's not taking any bandwidth. Hey. I still got a connection. You're sort still of. here, but your job is it's all cut in out. A circuit. It's coming in slowly. Rotate. It's, we're waiting for it to rotate. Have we got a screen share taking place? Yeah, we can see a track, but it's sideways. There that's we go. Right. There we go. Oh, that's oh, terrible. Okay, but I found what, the screen share. You're good. Now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. You're good. I found this today. Uh, it's in a theme park. It's a Ferrari can, can he track that he found in a theme park. Okay, it's in a theme park and it's being uh, operated as an attraction. It's got, um, there's another picture of it. It's got, can you see a car? No, yeah. No. It's a hill climb. Made by Ogilvy. There we go. <clears throat> what you call a stamp steel. Yeah, that's I'll a, stop that's the share. A, a we'll try it another, another time. A Palmer whisper jet. They they oh, made them their stamp no, steel. No. They're they're as heavy as a brick. They have an O ring drive. Yeah. Um they were used as rental cars for many, many years because they're low maintenance and tough as all, tough as nails. It that's, does. It's that's, a nice looking track. It's not quite a, it's not quite a traditional uh, hill climb because of those little S's as you come off the banking and round the, the, the turn in front of the drivers. Those little S's there are something that we don't see very often. But other than that, it looks really nice. He said it came problem. from the United States, apparently. Quite possible. If it's an Ogilvy track, it, you know, it's Steve Ogilvy. Not Canada. Yeah, we, we, had, we, had, we had to have a go today, didn't we? And how did it go? Well, um, is 11.99 seconds a record for a track like that? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's for the slowest lap ever done, but... Uh... Oh, absolutely um, no, no. The, 
That's I I guess eleven point nine nine seconds says more about the cars than it says about the track. Yeah, yeah. well, that was the uh, that was the best I could do. There was probably a twelve second breakout. <laughs> Like if you go beyond twelve seconds, you just get an eleven nine nine. The tires must have been rock hard. Yeah, they look it. In the photo, they looked like it. Oh, it was very soft sponge. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that they had any traction necessarily. Yeah. Absolutely, that's correct. Um. Get my results on screen. Uh, Hopefully you can nice see the race results yeah. when that comes. Yeah. Apparently that's the best lap of the group. <laughs> Has my screen share worked? Yes, sir. And that's me driving the yellow car in case you were wondering. <laughs> I, th I thought you were on black. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so we went for a second race. And I chose the wrong car. And what happened next was that I picked up another controller at the same time. And I drove two cars. Oh. <laughs> a total of 29 laps. Oh, okay. One in each hand? Yes, exactly that. One in each hand. Running them against one another. Yeah. Did you win? The only two the only two cars that were kind of close the whole time. <laughs> there was uh, as far as I was aware there was like one maybe two corners where I was required to lift. Uh yeah. one was the corner you might call the lead on and the other one was the um the end of the S section in front of the drivers the the tight bit at the end of it. Yeah, and apart from that, everywhere else was flat out. Yeah, but it was a bit of fun. So you did win. <laughs> yeah, I did. First and second, I did ask him if, he, if he'd had bare feet, he could have taken third and fourth too. As what? Well, yes, <laughs> that's possible. So I did ask him, can they uh, can they turn it up for me and let me have another go? <laughs> <laughs> did they tell you what voltage it was running at? They told me that. Uh, Every lane was uh, independently adjustable, and they have them all configured so that the cars are manageable for all the clients. Ah, good for them. Oh, yeah. uh, that's the right way to do it for people who've never done it before. But, yeah. They weren't yeah, matched. They I'm were nowhere advising. near matched. I'm advising the a, a local go-kart club. And I also uh, told them to turn down the voltage. And there are a few people complain, and then they say, okay, we'll turn it up to 12 volt, and you can go two laps, and then you decide what you want to do. And they all uh, would rather like to run at uh, these uh, 9 to 10 volts, because then they can actually get around the track. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they had they had solder in the braids to make the braid last longer. Um, parts of the track were had very very low braid. I was walking around there, and whilst it was out of action, I was touching the braid and saying, "Oh, I'm surprised how low the braid is in the track." And they said, "Well, it's not like that everywhere." And I said, "Oh, oh, how come? Why?" And they said, "Well, it gets such a lot of use." that just about every winter we have to rebraid certain ones of the corners. And over time, we've ripped out the braid enough that we've damaged the recess and we've had to have a corner or two rerouted. And so the braid in certain corners is very low by about, I would say, two and a half millimetres, two millimetres, whereas the main straight, it was just below the surface, much, much better. What in the world? What in the world? I mean, sure. It, 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 is it, it, it must be an absolute constant 24 7 use to wear out the braid of the track that much so quickly. 
Or, and it's my guess, that what they've done to those cars is causing the braid to wear much too quickly. Like, well, they've uh, increased the longevity of the braid on the cars by impregnating them with solder. At least 70% of the bit that would touch the track was solder. The front was still braid, but it was all filled with black muck. <laughs> and basically, the cars are in a, a, a relatively poor condition. We've had two goes with it now, and we really don't feel like going back because it was a little bit disappointing. But, but there it is. A slot car track being operated as an attraction in a theme park, and it was it was the first and only time I've seen that done. And um, I don't know of anywhere else in the UK that's got one. And it makes good money. Uh, at at four pounds fifty a, a go for six minutes, it's pretty wow. good money. Oh, well, that is a it's a token system, and if you want to if you want to pay for a go, it's four pounds fifty. But if you buy tokens, you can get it a lot less. So we bought a lot of tokens for the whole for the whole park, and now the kids are riding go karts, archery, clay pigeon shoot, or laser clay pigeon shoot, and all the other activities. Crazy golf. We'll do all that during this week, weather permitting. Cool. <laughs> But it uh, is a problem if you, you want to run a thing like that, like that. <laughs> um, in, in public and, and especially if you do not have somebody around that really knows and understands how to maintain it. It is too much maintenance really to just have uh, it sitting and, and uh, as an attraction like that. And, and by now they have ruined that track. Mm. Yes, and, there were... There were two or three operators at different times of the day that I saw. Obviously, it was a it was a much more attractive proposition whilst the rain fell, and that all late lanes were in use whilst it was raining out. But then, once the weather was fine, we could we could, we did get an opportunity for just four of us to run. But uh, there was one car that we soon identified as being the only quick car. There's, there's potentially two, the orange lane and the green lane, which tend to be, which are pretty central. And my boys both wanted those every time we went. So I haven't had a go with the good cars yet. I might have to sneak back without them, eh? <laughs> go set them on the mini golf and go go have another go at the track. Yes. Well, you know, with a proper setup, a, a Eurosport car and a, a, a track in, in, reasonable condition to that size you should get around in about four seconds i agree i think so i I've, I've looked on youtube for the same circuit uh i was searching for ogilvy hill climb and i found a few videos and one of them was by the brushless race slot car racing association hosted on two years ago and it was one of the early brushless cars doing it in a pra about that time yeah Judging by my, you know, watching of a video, there was no timing showing, but yes, it was it was lightning fast. And I thought to myself, wow, there's so much potential in these tracks. And it's so it, you know, it's it it's surprisingly large. When I walked into the room, I, I was surprised by how large it really was in person. Yeah, they're basically but yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's a big thing. Apparently, they're in different sizes, too. You can get 105 feet, 140 feet, I think, all Ogilvy hill climbs. Slight variations around where the donut is. Some of them are mirrored, things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, it'll all depend on who originally ordered the track from Steel Ogilvy because, they, you know, they would the, the original design will, would have been uh, dictated by the, the space that the original buyer had. Hmm. Uh, in terms of in terms of you know how long what the footprint can be uh the relative diameter of some of the turns to to the space that he had things like that apparently they purchased this one from a deceased gentleman who lived about 15 miles away and here in the south south southern end of wales hmm. and um it was just an opportunity that they got Purchased it and built a building around it, built a building for it, and it's run. It's served them very well, and it's been there, I think, eleven years. They said. 
Wow. So apparently there are only about a half a dozen people in the whole site that are capable of running it because of the continual uh, attention that the cars require. You know, I picked my car up, turned it over and straightened the braid and one thing and another. Uh, one of the kids' cars was stopping in the donut, and th that was the problem that with that one. So I quickly adjusted its braid, and it ran perfectly from that point onward. But that was part of the reason for the disappointment, you see, because sometimes the cars they, they weren't they weren't a match for one another, and sometimes the cars weren't even reliable. Well, Wayne, but when you know, to, you know. Wayne, go back. They'll offer you a job. <laughs> hey, maybe so. Well. I think if ever you want to know why the slot car fad of the late 1960s collapsed so quickly, you're experiencing some of the problems yes. right now. Some some of the reasons for the collapse at that time. When you're operating it and providing the cars and people don't look after them because they're not their own. Of course. In the United States, there were thousands of similar I, I'm not, I don't know much about Ogilvy or, or the others but there were thousands of those tracks yep. uh, yeah yeah there, there there were more slot car tracks in the US than there were bowling alleys till about 1966 yep and where they go most of them went into dumpsters yeah just destroyed them dumpsters well, on fires yeah, well, yep. a lot of people lost a lot of money because the, you couldn't pay for the square footage. It, 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 there was no return on the rentals, yeah. Well, I saw a video of a, is it a place called Fast Tracks Hobbies? Yeah. Where they have a very similar one in, in purple. And that's, that's, a whole was, track. that's not even close. It, uh, it was a similar layout. It's I wasn't certain it was not even, Is it not? No. Well, in the video, they managed to mention the fact that $12 bought you 30 minutes of track time, and that in the UK is nine and a half pounds. And I thought, well, we're getting six minutes for around three pounds. Much better to go to a commercial raceway. Yeah. Which we don't have. I don't know if there is one anywhere in the UK. I don't know. There are clubs, but I don't think there are any commercial raceways anymore. Oh, there is. Yes, there's one in Coventry. No, Milton Keynes. There's one in Milton Keynes. I know there's one in Milton Keynes because I saw yes. the left master system for them. They've got several tracks on the first floor above a shopping complex, I think. Okay. Must make an effort to get there as well for a holiday, huh? Enis, uh, can I ask you a question? I th seem to have read that uh, Electric Dreams acquired a couple of tracks. Correct. Do you know anything about that? Yes. The tracks the tracks that were uh, at Buena Park Raceway, two of, two of the three tracks that were at Buena Park Raceway, yeah. uh, were acquired when the raceway closed, were acquired by Electric Dreams. Uh, the king track and the flat track that they had in the front of the of the store. Uh, they are in storage at the moment, uh, awaiting uh, restoration, and uh, they will eventually be opened in a in somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where yet. Uh, in a building that belongs to Scott Bader, who's the owner of Electric Dreams. Yeah. So yeah, they, they, those tracks will come back. Um, uh, but I'm not sure what the what the timing is on that. No, but they are really well known historical tracks, so it's yeah, nice they, that they, somebody took care of them. Yeah, the King Track is uh, G5, I think, or G, or maybe G3. It's one of the early girding tracks, um, and it's not in terribly bad condition. The braid is bad; it, it needs to be completely rebraided, but the and and some of the slots are getting a little wide uh, from lots and lots of wing car racing. Uh, so there might be some work to be done there. 
the flat track was an MTT track, and it started started life as far as I know in California up in Chino uh, or Chico up in Northern California, and um, it's been moved around a little bit, but it's not in it's not in great shape. It's it also needs quite a lot of work. Uh, it's kind of bumpy and the the the, um, the 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 borders the sides of the track the the walls of the track were um, very damaged from years and years and years of crashes and it needs new braid everywhere All right. but yeah we've electric dreams has got them uh, the plan is to re, to to uh, restore and uh, reopen them at some point I, I just found a photo from the heyday that you were talking about, Dennis, and I thought I'd share it just for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the purple, purple mile. Collection. That's a purple <laughs> mile. That's yeah. a purple mile. <laughs> but yes, sir. So, so that's a that was the American model car, American, uh, American model raceways. They called it the Sovereign. And it's 220 feet, which is a scale, 124th scale mile. Uh, that photograph, I think, was taken at Playland uh, in That's San wrong. Francisco. Yep. And yeah, for that, sure. Playland. And, and that particular track now stands at, uh, is at Modelville in, uh, in um, Massachusetts, Ooh. in Ashland or Asheville, Massachusetts. They also yeah. have a ho version of that at the same track in in Correct. massachusetts yeah uh, peter lentros is the guy who owns the who owns modelville and look, look, look at the size of that room oh yeah i mean if you if you if you go looking for playland playland was a was a big deal i mean jim probably knows more about it than i do that that's only part of it yeah wow because they had they had a number of tracks that's a that was a red or an orange in the background, and then they still had, I think, a, a blue king as well. All of the American model raceways tracks had a different color of siding, so you know they started with a, a yellow and a black and a red and a blue, and then the sovereign was purple, and they all had names. They were they were uh, the sovereign and the king and the royal and the. Uh, the yellow Monarch. Was, a, was a Windsor for some reason or other. I'm not quite sure why. I think yellow was Monarch. the Monarch, wasn't it? Yellow Monarch? Oh, it was a Monarch, yeah. Maybe. Alan had a Windsor. In his old Alan shop. had a Windsor, yeah. Um, no, that's the orange was a Monarch, I think, Jim. Or, oh, yeah, I think you're right. That is actually quite a nice track, <laughs> the orange, the, the Monarch. What was what uh, was the black? The black was a... The black was what they... was. Uh, it's like a baby king, sort of. Yeah, but flat without without yeah. bankings. Um, uh, and I don't recall what the red was either now, because the red had a had like a D shaped donut, uh, and it had more pronounced bumps in the straightaway than the than the um, than the blue king did, and it was a bit shorter. But yeah, the, the the orange was actually quite a fun track. It, it it had a big bank, and then it had basically you came out of the big bank into one turn that went under the uh, under the crossover and into a donut. And then as you came out of the donut up onto the to the top onto the lead on before you went back down the straightaway, there was a set of wiggles, and uh, they they were a lot of fun with a more modern car. Because you could really drive into them fast, because they started with fairly gentle radii and then they ended with tighter radii, so you could dive into them and the car would just sort of would sort of shake a little and then really wiggle at the end. And if you got the braking right, you were through there in absolutely no time. Uh, Wayne, here's the track you were talking about: fast tracks, purple track. Oh, yeah. Yes, and it is completely different. There's no donut there. Yeah. Yeah. They race on that every Saturday night in uh, Sacramento area, and we we race there thirty second scale on their other on their flat track. Yeah, I just I was I, I was literally searching for that term, and um, a video of a news reporter, a local news reporter, went there, and she divulged the pricing and the fact that it 
Yeah, in fact, yeah, okay, there's so a pricing the place in Milton return. Keynes, and the place in Milton Keynes is called Race Wars UK. Race Wars, that's right. Race Wars UK. I think they've got some Carrera and some plastic sectionals. It might even be a polycar too. It's not all wood tracks. It's, yeah, it's a polycar. Got... I'm looking at the uh, looking at their Facebook page, and they've got polycar. They've got a big polycar, and then they've got a wooden one. I think polycar is four lane, down. and it's digital. I think race wars shut down. Did it? Did it? I'm pretty sure it did. I don't hear from it anymore. There was a time. It says temporarily closed on the on the yeah. Google search that I've just done. There was something, I, as I recall, it had something to do with the location not being viable or available or whatever the case may be. No idea. It was, I believe it was in like a prime location, so probably just too expensive. <laughs> the board wanted something else there, or yeah, there's on their Facebook page is an announcement from October twenty two, no, uh, twenty twenty two. Saying uh, we are currently close due to technical issues, the Halloween tournaments will not be taking place, which yeah. is a pity. It's still, and as far as we know, no, don't know where any of those tracks are or ended yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and we could the stories that can be told about tracks that have gone missing and gone you know, been moved around over the years, club tracks, commercial tracks, the whole lot. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's probably hundreds of storage oh. units out there with tracks just sitting in there. Yep. You know, watch Storage Wars and, and see who. <laughs> yeah, the problem is too, of course, they've probably been badly stored and you, if you of ever course. did find them, they would be in, in, in absolutely yeah. terrible condition. Might as well have been thrown in the garbage for that. We had we had two like that in South Africa. One that one where uh, and the, the weird part was that uh, they both went missing from the same building, about uh, eight or ten years apart. Um, but I think I've told that story before, so I don't need to tell it again. That's okay. We tell stories over and over here. We're old. <laughs> That's how it works. Well, I mean, if you want to hear the story, I can tell the story. There was a one of the small gold, one of the small gold mining towns on the eastern side of Johannesburg, a little place called Benoni, which coincidentally is where I was born, uh, had a, a stadium on the outskirts of the town where they used to run. Uh, Roundy, roundy racing, hot rods and uh, speedway and things like that, right? So it was uh, sometimes tarmac, sometimes um, sometimes cinders, but generally tarmac. And lots of roundy, roundy. See everybody, you know, bring out your car on a on a Friday night and and race. And on the grounds of the stadium was a building that had been set up uh, to be, I think, uh, concession stands or something like that. Uh, or offices or whatever, but it was never used. And for many years, it was a slot car club. It was it uh, a club by the name of the Daytona Slot Car Club had a very nice six-lane track, uh, one thirty-second scale track in this building. And I managed to race there, I think once, maybe twice, uh, in around nineteen sixty-nine or seventy, around about there. And then the the uh, the owners of the stadium decided that they wanted to use that building, so they gave these guys notice, and the guys had to move. So they moved their track out and put it in storage, before, uh, trying to find somewhere else to go. And when they tr when they found somewhere else to go, they went back to the storage facility to get their track, and it had been used for firewood by the security guards, and there was no track left. Uh, and that was the end of that, we thought. However, the people who owned the stadium never actually developed the building. So many years later, uh, one of the other clubs in that part of the of uh, the eastern side of Johannesburg, and there were quite there were two or three of them 
at one stage because it's an area around the airport and around other things like that where there are a lot of guys who were blue collar workers and machinists and and so on. So, you know, it was a rich place for hobbies. Anyway, this other trek had lost their their building and they found that this building was open. They contacted a guy at the at the uh, stadium management company who said, yeah, sure, you know, come along, you know, come in. Uh, but uh, we don't have electricity in that building right now because we are having a little bit of a of an argument with the city council and they've cut off the electricity. And these guys said, that's yeah, fine. So they, they, they moved their track into the building and they rigged up a generator into the wiring in the building and they raced for a while. And then all of a sudden, one night when they arrived to for their for their evening racing, there was no track in the building. And the the the, the next day, somebody went to the um, to the uh, management company to say, you know, what's going on? Where's our track? And they couldn't find the guy that they had been talking to, and apparently he had been fired because he had been skimming money off of the off of the all of the money that he'd been that they were the guys in the Slockout Club had been paying him in cash for their monthly rental had been going in his back pocket, right? And uh, they knew nothing about it. But nobody at the rent at the stadium company could find the track or knew anything about it. Bang, track gone missing for a couple of years. Three or four years later, uh, we find out that another club had gone or another group of guys had gone to the stadium company to say, uh, can we use this building because uh, we we are a electrics club and we want to build a track and have a clubhouse. And the, apparently somebody at the, at the stadium management company said, uh, sure, we'll rent you the place, but um, why do you want to build a track? We've got a track. <laughs> and they said, oh. Uh, and so they moved the track back into the building. And then the guys from the Scalextric Club decided, oh, no, this is no good of a track. We don't want this track. And there was still some problem with the electricity. And they moved and they decided, no, we're, we're, we're going elsewhere. And fortunately, somebody in our club found out about this. And we went to this guy and we said, hey, uh, that track, you know, what do you want to do with it? The guy said, oh, you know. You want to make me an offer? We said, yeah, we'll give you 200 bucks for the track. Okay, fine. We grabbed one of our friends. Uh, one of the members of our club had a, a race car, so we, we took his race car trailer, and we went down there, and we loaded the track pieces onto the race car trailer. Um, that track was built like a freaking battleship, i tell you something. It was, it was heavy gauge, angle iron frame, all welded together. It was in two pieces, and you could turn the pieces up, and they would just fit through a regular door. So it wasn't a terribly wide track, fairly long. And uh, and we we took it out of there, and off we went with it. And um, it stood in my garage for a couple of years until we found a place for it, and then we uh, restored it, and we uh, and we ran on it for a number of years after that. So it came back. I'm just looking to see if I can find the photograph. Hold on a moment. Tracks. Yes, tracks. There it is. Okay, so I need to share screen. You got it? Yep. yep. Okay, so this this was the track. It splits in the middle, um, and uh, this was the the surface after uh, we had found it again, and after it stood in my garage because it was originally painted black, and then later on we painted it this gray color. Uh, so it had a um, it was eight feet wide by you know, maybe twenty feet long. So it didn't have a terrible. It wasn't a terribly long track. It had a a long straightaway in front of the drivers, and then this kind of little S at the end, and then it went into a couple of big right-hand and left-hand S's, 
and then finally a left-hander up the hill over the bridge and then back around and back underneath. Um, a major home track advantage on this track when you were racing the cars that we raced at the speed that they had, um, but it really did something for your driving. It was, it was actually a very, very nice little track. So it moved around a couple of couple of times after we were done with it and sold it. Uh, then it went to a club out on the western side, or the far west, uh, the western part of the Gold Reefs. And uh, whatever happened to it after that, I don't know. But it hasn't been, I don't think it's been run on now for some maybe 10 years. But it might still be somewhere and somebody might still be using it. So that's my track story for the day. Hopefully it's out there somewhere being enjoyed. Yeah. And yep. it's, it's at our two-hour mark, so we're going to wave bye, and I'm going to hit end stream, and everybody say bye. Bye-bye.